QSO Today, Episode 443, Rick Palm, K1CE. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest amateur radios and accessories for your ham radio station, and by Nuts and Volts Magazine. Just a reminder that the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo opens next weekend, March 24th, 2023, at 1800 Pacific Daylight Time. Tickets are on sale now. Click on the banner in this week's show notes page or go to qsotodayhamexpo.com for more information. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign 4Z1UG, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. So I was chatting with Anthony Luskery, KHZT, who was my guest on episode 305 of the QSO Today podcast. He's a big supporter of the podcast and the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, which is happening next Saturday, March 25th at 8 a.m. Pacific. That's when the presentations begin. Anthony mentioned that while the Expo will have over 40 fantastic presentations, it's the only ham radio convention that's open for a full 48 hours straight. This means that after the presentations for the day, you don't have to go back to your hotel room. Instead, you can head over to our roundtable lounge and spend the entire weekend chatting with your old and new ham radio friends. I'm really excited about the new Roundtable Lounge at the Expo. We've got virtual tables arranged by sponsor, by subject, by speakers, so when speakers are finished they can come back to a table and answer even more questions, and even open seating for anyone to join. You can quickly see who's at each table, find a person or conversation you want to join, and click to join in. All the tables have Zoom-like features such as chat, messaging, and screen sharing so you can show off your shack or your latest project. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo starts this Friday, March 24th at 6 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I really encourage you to come, buy a ticket, as it will help cover the facility costs and allow us to hold future expos. And don't forget to invite your ham radio friends for this unique and valuable experience. A ticket costs $15 for the full 48 hours and the additional 30-day on-demand period to view any presentations you missed. See you at the Expo. Rick Palm, K1CE, is a well-known figure in the ham radio community, having spent a career at the ARRL and writing columns and articles that have been widely read and appreciated by fellow ham radio enthusiasts. With a particular interest in public safety radio and ARES, the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, Rick has dedicated his time and expertise to ensuring that these critical communications channels remain reliable and effective. Although now retired and based in Florida, Rick remains an active participant in the ham radio community, regularly checking into nets and staying involved in his local ARES chapter. K1CE is my QSO today. K1CE, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Rick? Yeah, hi, Eric, 4Z1UG from K1 Charlie Echo. Rick, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, it started for me as a, as a child in, uh, in South Jersey. My dad was an electrical engineer at uh, RCA uh, Labs in Camden. He um, was a ham um, W9ZZC prior to World War II, and he never got on the air because the war came along and shut down all of uh, amateur radio, basically. So that's how I uh, originally you know, became interested. And I was just a young child. He'd bring home uh, he'd bring home some pieces of equipment, some radio equipment and power supplies and stuff like that. And I would play with all the knobs and you know kind of set up a, a, you know, a pseudo ham station in my bedroom there, uh, you know, from having visited hams in the, in the uh, area there uh, outside of Camden. And uh, I think the radio association there, the South Jersey radio association was active in that area. And uh, my dad took me over to visit uh, some of their hams. So that's where I originally uh, developed my interest in it. 
Did your dad become a ham, or did he become active after World War II? After World War II, he did not renew his license. It lapsed, and then we both became licensed at the same time. We took our novice exam in 1976. He was WN1YIM, and I was WN1YIM. So that's how we got started. We did it together there, and uh, and that was the uh, that was the very beginning. How old were you when you got your first novice license? That would have been uh, uh, 23, I guess, 23, 24, something like that. When he was taking you to the South Jersey Amateur Radio Association, he was no longer a ham, but he had friends who were hams? Yes. I think his primary interest was in was in getting me interested in electronics and maybe, you know, ultimately follow in his professional footsteps as an electrical engineer. My brother ended up uh, uh, being an electrical engineer, and so did my sister. He's an electrical engineer too. And how about you? Well, uh, <laughs> that was not uh, that was neither my passion nor my. Um, you know, I really had no aptitude for uh, <laughs> electronics and engineering and so forth. I uh, I ultimately ended up with a a couple of degrees. One was in business administration from the University of Massachusetts, and. Uh, and that I had a degree uh, in liberal arts and a degree in uh, nursing, which was a second career for me that I started uh, in 2005. So however long ago that was, what, almost 20 years ago, I guess. So the second half or the second third, perhaps, of your life. Yeah, second third, yeah. I ended up uh, working in the medical intensive care unit for um, for years as a registered nurse at the big county hospital in Daytona Beach, Florida. So the current QTH is Daytona Beach? Current QTH is uh, way out here in the sticks. If you know where Gainesville is, we're like 35 miles northwest of there, really out in a very rural uh, farmland uh, country here in northern Florida. Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I love it out here. It's peaceful and quiet. Alligators? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But they're really pretty benign. I think they get a bad rap, uh, basically. <laughs> The alligators get a bad rap in Florida, huh? Yeah, I, they're, uh, um, I think they're a lot more gentle than people think. They just look, uh, you know. They look prehistoric. They do look. And they are prehistoric, too. So um, They've been around for millions and millions of years. So, uh, yeah, but we do have those. And, uh, you know, and basically just rural uh, farmland out here and forests. It's uh, really a really gorgeous country. A lot of, a lot of springs and, uh, and so forth. So... Uh, yeah, I uh, I love it out here. I, uh, Did your siblings also become ham radio operators? No, they they never had an interest in it whatsoever. I was the only one that uh, you know really had a uh, an interest in it, basically. Well, isn't that interesting? You know, you have two siblings that are electrical engineers, right? And the electrical engineers decided not to become hams, but the one who decided not to become an electrical engineer is the more than active ham. Yeah, that is, uh, that's very true. That's ironic, I guess, yeah. When you and your dad put together a first novice station, what was the station? It was a Heath kit. I had a Heath kit uh, Apache transmitter and a Hammerland uh, receiver. So that was the original uh, setup there with a antenna tuner and a uh, multi-band dipole in the backyard. And that was it. Do you remember the Hammerland receiver model? No. Uh, maybe uh, I don't know HQ 110X or something like that. Is that ring a bell? Yeah, something like that. But it was um, uh, that was the setup, and the transmitter was I believe it was crystal controlled. I think was the antenna tuner with the Johnson Matchbox. No, you know I can't remember the brand of it. In those days, there wasn't a lot of choice, as I recall. No, that's correct. Heathkit had an antenna tuner. Yeah, it wasn't a Heathkit. It was a uh, a black box, um, Dentron maybe, does that uh, ring a bell? I think they ended up making amplifiers as well, right? I think that's right. I, so I think that was the one, I'm not 100% sure. To a multiband antenna? Yep, to a multiband uh, dipole, right, in the backyard. And did you like the novice experience? Yeah, I sure did. I, uh, I still have um, the QS card, uh, QSL card from my very first contact with a ham in Connecticut. And I was living in the Boston area at the time. And then I remember on Christmas morning, uh, which is my birthday too, by the way, <laughs> Christmas Day, and 
I got up early in the morning and I uh, I remember it clear as day as having a nice long CW QSO with a station in Czechoslovakia. And that was just uh, just a real thrill that uh, I'll always remember. So that's kind of how I got uh, got started, and then uh, and then I got a, um, a Drake TR thirty three C, which was a uh, crystal controlled uh, two meter FM rig, basically. So and that allowed me to uh, get onto the local repeater, which was uh, the Waltham repeater, and just outside of Boston, O four six four. I believe that the Drake TR-33, that was like a luggy talkie, right? It looked like a little mobile radio with a battery. Correct. That is correct, yeah. And a leather strap. Yeah, that is right. That's right. It was, uh, I think, partially synthesized. I'm not sure how it works exactly, but uh, you put a uh, receive crystal in there, and I guess it was, you know, the transmit frequency was somehow synthesized by the rig or some, something like that. Let's talk a little bit about what the current rig is. The current rig is a uh, like just about everybody. It's a, I have an ICOM IC7300. Uh, I have uh, an ICOM 2-meter rig and a, a Yezu 2-meter rig and uh, a Yezu 70-centimeter rig that I use. And that's, uh, that's really the rundown, basically. And I just have a um, multi-band dipole up here and a uh, couple of uh, a VHF beam and a UHF beam for those FM rigs, basically. And, and, and that's about it. Um, I've, I've done some FT8. Frankly, you know, to be honest with you, I kind of got bored with it. So now I'm back to, uh, so I'm really not on that anymore. I'll uh, listen for some six meter openings and try to do a little CW or phone or something like that on, on six. But mostly, mostly um, I check into... Uh, uh, local Aries nets, you know, both on um, uh, several two-meter repeaters in the area and then a morning uh, Aries net for northern Florida Aries. So I, and uh, that's on 75-meter uh, on uh, phone. So, and that's, uh, that's basically it. The rigs that you have keep you on the air and checked into the local surroundings for the most part, it sounds to me. For the most part, right. I'm not really a... A DXer or a contester, and uh, I like CW, but I'm a terrible, terrible CW operator. <laughs> yeah, I participate in contests by, you know, once in a while. First, by listening and making sure I have all of the, <laughs> the contact information and a piece of paper before I call the station and work them. You know, that that shows you how how bad I am at it. So, <laughs> kind of a little bit of stage fright on CW. Yeah, a little stage fright. Absolutely. Yeah, I know how that goes. And phone, too. I noticed something for the first time in my life. Now, I've been a ham for 50 years, but I've never had a spectrum display, you know, like the 7300 has. It's amazing that you hear through the years that people say, yes, the contest station is on 7105, and he's listening down or he's listening up. I guess you could picture in your mind what the manifestation of that looks like, but when you see it on a spectrum scope... When all of a sudden, you know, you see a single call and then you see all this grass rise up on both sides of that. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's actually quite startling. And frankly, to my dear listeners, this is the first time I ever noticed it was in the last month. And I thought, well, that's actually quite amazing. And that visual representation on that spectral scope is also amazing. Yeah, I think so, too. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. I like looking at it myself and... Uh... It's just it's just pretty cool, you know. Do you really need to have it? No, but it's uh, it's it's pretty neat to have. So yeah, I look at it too. I keep it uh, on my display there while I'm operating, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's just fun. <laughs> well, I'm watching CW signals, and you know what? I'm a visual learner, so all of a sudden, as soon as I saw what was happening, and I kind of figured out what it was right away. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, this is exactly what I might have thought it should look like. But then you kind of have to figure out, okay, so where's a place for me? You know, if I go between these two guys, will he hear me? It's a very interesting thing. It sounds very naive, I'm sure, to people who do this all the time. But it's amazing how this new technology allows us to see what's actually happening in the bands during the contest. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. And uh, it gives me something to look at while I'm, you know, checked into these, you know, these nuts and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's just fun, you know. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. And now this message from ICOM America. Got cabin fever? ICOM has the rigs that you need 
to get into the field or to update your ham shack with a variety of base stations, mobiles, and handhelds. ICOM's newest 2 meter amateur FM transceiver is the ICOM IC V3500 or the V3500. This 65 watt transceiver has a compact body and simple interface. Its features include simple operation with a modern white display, instant volume loud and mute functions, emergency call and alarm features, and a 4.5 watt audio amplifier for loud and crisp audio. The ICOM ICT10 is a dual-band VHF-UHF rugged portable that meets or exceeds standard military testing in its IP67 waterproof case. The ICT-10 can withstand any field activities ahead of it. Features include extra-loud 1500 milliwatt audio amplified speaker, DTMF front-mounted keypad, 5 watts of output power, 11 hours of operating time, and NOAA weather alerts. The ICOM IC7300 is our favorite high-performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed every ham's expectations for an entry-level HF transceiver. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. Features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. The IC705 is the perfect sidekick and QRP companion. Base station features and functionality at the tip of your fingers in a portable package, covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. The IC705 features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall display, 5 watts with a BP272 battery pack, and 10 watts when connected to 13.8 volts DC. Single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions, micro USB connector, Bluetooth, and wireless LAN, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card slot, and a speaker microphone, the HM243, which is included in the package. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the optional backpack, the LC192, with a special compartment for your IC705 with room for accessories and your lunch. Designed from user input, the ICOM ID5100A is mobile radio innovation taken to the next level. This rig offers an intuitive user touchscreen interface and connects with Android devices and Bluetooth headsets via the optional Bluetooth module. This mobile rig includes up to 50 watts output power, integrated GPS receiver, DV-DV dual watch, DV-FM repeater list function, D-plus reflector linking, and SD card slot for voice and data storage. Finally, the ICOM ID52A is a VHF-UHF dual-band portable with D-Star and FM functionality in a beautiful handheld package. This radio supports conventional FM communications and D-Star simplex repeater regional worldwide calls over the D-Star internet network. The ID52 features include a full-color 2.3-inch waterfall display, VV, UU, VU, and dual DV mode, integrated GPS GLONASS receiver including grid square location, micro SD card slot, micro USB for data transfer, programming, and charging, and it is IPX7 waterproof. You can share the Android app for D-Star operation, battery pack, and headsets between the ID52A and your IC705. So there you have it the wide variety of complementary ICOM transceivers to open up the coming spring soda, POTA, contests, DXing, and EMS operation. You can find out more about these fine rigs by clicking on the ICOM banner in this week's show notes page. And when you visit an ICOM dealer near you to purchase one or all of these rigs, be sure to tell them that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO. So let's back up a little bit. Okay, so you didn't take the path well taken by the rest of your family, and that was into electrical engineer. You took the other path. Where did that path take you? I graduated from high school in 72. Um, I was a member of the Lexington. I, I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, outside of Boston, and uh, I was a member of the Lexington Amateur Radio Club, and that's how I 
I never got uh, involved, you know, organizationally with uh, with ham radio. But um, I went to uh, I went to a community college, local community college, and got a two year degree in liberal arts, and then went to the University of Massachusetts for uh, a bachelor's degree, and then I worked for the league headquarters for twenty years, and then. How did you find yourself there? When you were at the Lexington Amateur Radio Club, were you a board member, a worker? How did you find yourself working at the league? Well, I enjoyed writing, actually. I was the newsletter editor for the uh, Lexington Amateur Radio Club, and I, I, I discovered that I really enjoyed writing. And, uh, and, uh, and after uh, I, I graduated uh, from, from UMass in 79, I had a my dining room table was covered with you know job postings and you know I needed to start to work you know <laughs> my parents were excited about that prospect too so <laughs> so this is pre-internet so where did you find job postings if you were looking all over the place newspapers basically newspapers and uh, maybe some journals or something like that but now there happened to be I just happened to have a copy of QST um, on the dining room table too. And I was just looking at, um, there used to be a column in QST called League Lines, if you remember that. Yes. They uh, had a job posting in there for a membership services assistant. So uh, that was basically an entry-level job there in the old uh, membership services department, which is uh, long uh, defunct after uh, a reorganization in in 1985. So it was an entry-level job, essentially? Right. Maybe more administrative than writing at that time? It was more administrative, although um, I started to write for the magazine. Right off the bat, I had a, I would contribute items for the Happenings column, which was uh, conducted at the time by uh, Dale Clift. So I would write some items for him, and then they gave me the Washington Mailbox column. So I, so I, I, I was the editor of that. I, I wrote that column, basically, for... Uh, a couple of years. I'm just curious, what was that column about? I mean, I have some ideas, but in terms of the League has its people in Washington protecting our interests. Right. Was this part of that? Not really. The the Washington Mailbox column was to help radio amateurs interpret uh, the FCC rules. So uh, what I would do is I'd come up with a particular section of the rules, you know, describe what they are and then answer members' questions on, uh, well, is this legal or is that legal and so forth. So I would write up all these answers and then I would send them to uh, my contact at the FCC in Washington and he would go over them and uh, and basically approve them. So so I did that for a few years and uh, but my favorites uh, my favorite writing back then was uh, I wrote several of the. Um, it seems to us uh, editorials in the on page nine of QST about a uh, ended up writing about six or eight of them over the years and uh, that was always uh, that was always a real thrill to have your writing in the in the front editorial of the magazine so that was probably the biggest thrill I, I had in my whole career there I was on a number of subjects when in, like the cable TV uh, debacle you know there was egress from the cable TV systems back then on especially on channel E, which was 145.25 megahertz. So uh, that was a big thorn in the side to hams, obviously. I wrote a few editorials about that. It, with the problem with hams, it was twofold. There was uh, problems with egress, um, you know, interference coming from, you know, supposedly closed a closed cable system. And then ingress, too. Um, you know, a ham operating on the two-meter band would get into the, you know, into the neighbor's cable TV system. And so that was a big problem, too. Anyway, so those were, you know, I was, I was involved with that and I'm writing a couple of editorials for that. The commission in 1979, they proposed to rewrite the entire uh, Part 97 rules in so-called, uh, quote, uh, plain language, unquote. So that was a that was a major proceeding. So I was involved with uh, drafting the league's comments on that. And I wrote an editorial that, uh, about that whole that whole thing, too. You did some product reviews, as I recall. Yeah, a few product reviews. Those were always fun to do. They're still fun to do. You know, you get to play with a new radio and then write about it. I always enjoyed that. Um, and so I still do that, too. So that's uh, 
And that's a lot of, uh, really a lot of fun. You started writing, I think this is what I've seen in the last 20 years, you write a public service column for QST. Right. Do you still do that? Yeah, I still do that. I did that column back in the 90s, uh, too, late 80s possibly as well. And then, uh, uh, and then I started doing it, doing it again uh, in 2012. So I've been doing that column now since, uh, since 2012, so 20, a little over 20 years of doing the public service column, which I just thoroughly enjoy. Um, I'm really grateful that I can still do that and that uh, they still may, they still have me on to, to do that column. That is really a lot of fun, and I, I really love to write. The main challenge with that column for me is coming up with a good topic every month. You know, if you, you can do the math, I started doing the column again in 2012, so that's over 10 years, so 10 times 12, that's 120 columns or so. <laughs> Being the editor of this column, does that drive your interest in public service, or did public service drive your interest in writing the column? I'd say both. You know, I was always involved with, uh, uh, especially the national traffic system and handling, uh, and traffic handling, uh, and the ARIES program, you know, going back to square one, basically. Um, uh, so I guess, you know, my interest in my interest in that, then that was, then the column came much later and it was just a, a good match uh, for me because that was something I'd always been interested in. So I'm very, very technically disinclined. You know, I have no aptitude for that, uh, for writing, you know, technical articles and, and that type of thing. But I think a successful amateur radio public safety response usually doesn't depend on the technology. It depends on the organization, the leadership. Yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it. Mostly it involves hams that are uh, competent with operating their radios and are you know, comp competent with some basic, you know, public service, you know, parameters like the incident command system and uh, and that type of thing. Although uh, on any, you know, deployment for, you know, disaster or anything, you want to have someone that, you know, has some technical technical competence that could maybe, you know, perhaps fix some things, you know, in the field, you know, and that was never never my strong suit at all. How long would it take for an idea for an article or for a column to be written and drafted and approved and all that stuff before it actually went to print. We're in a period now where people are putting together newsletters that they're sending out in PDF format and they can turn it in a week. But I, I get the impression, obviously, that in the days of just print before the internet, it could take months for things to get turned around. Yeah, it takes months, actually. QST goes to print, you know, a month, it goes to the printer, you know, like a month before the issue comes out. And then there's the you know, the long editorial process the, of, uh, you know, I send my manuscript up to the up to them and the editors, the professional editors up there, and they go over it. It's also reviewed for consistency with, uh, you know, league policy. There is a there we have a director of emergency management. He's a paid professional staff member up there in Newington. And then he he reviews my column too to uh, make sure that, you know, it's consistent with uh, their policy and interests up there. So uh, he goes over it and uh, the editors uh, go through a couple of levels of editors and then and only then does it go to the uh, production department for layout and then one more round of, uh, you know, review and so forth. So, so it's a, you know, it's a couple of months process, basically. The headquarters staff up there, the editorial and production staff, they're they're just top notch. They're, I mean, they're total professionals. They really add a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of quality to that uh, that column. And in fact, in all of QST actually. So, but there's a lag period of, uh, you know, a few months before, you know, the issue is out on the street, so to speak. Well, it's been a great magazine for a hundred years, right? So, right. That speaks a lot. Unfortunately, the faces of the people that are actually doing the work to put QST out, you don't hear about them or see them. Their names are buried in the first parts of the magazine, but you really don't know much about them. That's very true. And they're the real workhorses, the true heroes of those uh, of QST. Um, and they just work diligently behind the, 
behind the scenes, basically. And uh, although they do, uh, several of them do write uh, articles for a QST from, from time to time, and uh, and they're excellent writers. They all have you know professional training, college degrees, and and English and writing and all of that type of thing. So they're they're really uh, really good. Right, makes a professional magazine. And I think, obviously, there's three or four magazines now coming out of the league for various kinds of users, right? There's QEX, there's the new magazine for beginners. Yep. So there's a wide variety of product being produced by the league. Can we go back a little bit in time? Because I came across something that I thought was very interesting, and I kind of wanted your take on it because you were a participant. In 1991, you traveled to the former Soviet Union with Edward Kritsky, NT2X, to introduce Soviet hams to amateur radio emergency communications. How did that trip go for you and the delegation from the United States? Well, that was a that was a fabulous opportunity. Um, yeah, Ed, Ed Gritsky asked me to go over there and give a talk at a conference in uh, Leningrad, St. St. Petersburg now, I think. But uh, uh, and so that was the mission. And, uh, you know, I got the approval to go. And that was a, just a fabulous trip. You know, the conference went really well. You know, I had an interpreter standing up there next to the podium with me. I thought that was pretty, <laughs> was pretty cool. Um, and I, I gave a speech and then they kind of uh, toured me around uh, the city of St. Petersburg, and then we took a midnight train down to Moscow and saw Box 88. You know, we toured that, and uh, and then I met with some other hams down there, and uh, more more or less just kind of social uh, socializing and and that sort of thing. It was a ten day trip, and that was uh, in August of 1991. And of course, that is a month that has uh, lived in uh, infamy. You know, that was when the uh, when Gorbachev was president, he had rolled out uh, Perestroika and Glasnost and the hardline communist regime and the Kremlin did not like that. So they attempted to overthrow the, the government, which they tried to do, and they uh, they lost. And that, of course, uh, the rest is history. That was the end of the USSR, the end of uh, communist Russia and, and so forth. And uh, I was lucky to get home. Um, you know, just before that, uh, you know, that whole thing happened. Ah, so you missed it because Kritsky was still there, apparently, and he writes a very long article about the involvement of amateur radio operators in helping to ensure that there was still communications between the White House and Gorbachev. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that is correct. So I thought maybe you were still there during the revolution. No, I I was out about maybe a week before it happened. Yeah. <laughs> That was quite a trip. And at the time, I'm just curious, I'm sure you got to see some ham radio stations of the period there. What did you see? Were they running the same kind of stuff that uh, American amateurs were running? I didn't see a lot of stations there, but what I did see was mostly kind of homebrew transmitters and receivers and so forth. I guess that's what I remember. There was a, I wrote an article about that trip. I can't remember what issue of QST it came out in, but uh, uh, there was a picture of me operating a station over there um, that was homebrew. I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, the Russians, there were a lot of really talented uh, hams, you know, technically competent. You know, I think a lot of them maybe had to homebrew their radios if they were going to, you know, be able to get on the air, that type of thing. I kind of had that impression. But very, uh, very, very uh, excited uh, hams over there, really into ham radio, and, and uh, it was it was really fun to visit with them. So I spent ten days over there. It was a great trip. Yeah, and I'll always remember it. We absorbed in Israel. We absorbed a million Russians in the 1990s. A theme that keeps coming up is that scarcity builds expertise. So when you're talking about the scarcity of electronic devices like ham radios like we had in the United States from all of the manufacturers. It led to a lot of engineering and home brewing. I'm reminded of computer programmers who were absolutely amazing running in machine languages because the computers that they were getting to work on were generations behind what we were used to in the West. Mm -hmm. But it built this amazing level of expertise from the scarcity. Yeah, it's I have a doctor, a neurologist that I went to some time ago, and he was telling me how to solve this problem. And this problem wasn't going to be solved by surgery or by drugs. 
And I said, well, I mean, don't you have a pill for this or something? He says, oh, I was trained in the Soviet Union. We didn't have big pharma and we didn't have surgical suites. So we had to learn how the body works. Right. Yeah, it's like necessity is the mother of invention, you know. That's right. There you go. That's it. Necessity is the mother of invention. I think that that's probably what you saw with the home brew was scarcity was the mother of invention. Yeah, I think that's right. But boy, there were a lot of enthusiastic radio amateurs. That is for sure. So <laughs> they were just really fun to be with. Do you have a big takeaway from that trip? Oh, boy. I guess the big takeaway for me was just how much excitement for amateur radio, though, there is in other parts of the world. Uh, I guess that would be the, you know, the, the big one. Were you a world traveler before? I had been to um, England and possibly a few other places. You've been here, as you said before? Yeah, I've been to Israel. I've been to several trips to uh, uh, Western Europe also. One of my passions is mountain climbing, and uh, or, or it was anyway, and traveled to, to the Alps and Italy and France and Switzerland several times to uh, climb mountains. You know, in the interview, uh, the, uh, after all that, I'm, I've been to South America and um, where else? East Africa. So you are well traveled. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, East Africa was a uh, yeah, it was an interesting place. Uh, I was there to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, and that's the that is in uh, on the Kenya Tanzania border. It's the tallest mountain in Africa. So I was there to do that, and uh, I've been to Egypt. Egypt, the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, and Israel, like you mentioned, and a uh, gorgeous country. Anyway, I, that's that's about it. Ireland, Scotland, and I think that's you know, that's about it. <laughs> when you hike, do you take a rig with you? Are you a soda kind of guy? No, no. For me, um, it, it was um, for mountaineering. It was always uh, you know you needed to go as lightly as you possibly could you know um so i wouldn't i wouldn't bring any radios or, or any anything like that so you had enough stuff with you as it is you had a you know a one or two heavy ropes a lot of carabiners and, you know hardware and stuff like that i want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast the ham radio workbench podcast with george kj6vu and now joined by rod va3on mike va3mw mark n6mts and vince ve6lk every two weeks george and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests workbenches this group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. Were you ever a delegate to the International Amateur Radio Union? I did serve as the uh, Region 2 Emergency Coordinator. Region 2 is the Americas, North and South America, and I was the Emergency Coordinator for Region 2. Uh, let's see, that was in 2002 or three, something like that. And I did that for uh, several years. Uh, I really enjoyed that. But that's the only official role I've had with the IARU. So, Rick, is there an international amateur radio response to emergencies based on perhaps this coordination with the IARU? Yeah, the uh, IARU has a, you know, there's three regions, of course. Each region does have an emergency coordinator, and uh, they devote uh, uh, quite a bit of their resources to uh, developing emergency communications programs and in other countries. So, yeah, they're very active in uh, in in that uh, in emergency communications, which is good to see. And they have a they've had a long line of excellent excellent coordinators. You know, they were you know, there's a great report that came out of uh Turkey after the big earthquake there in January and uh, uh excellent report by the Region 1 emergency coordinator about uh amateur radio involvement there. So, yeah, to answer that's the long answer to your question. <laughs> what do ARES groups in the United States, what do they do really well now? Boy, well, they do a great job in uh, organizing at the local level and providing 
backup communications for EOCs and emergency management personnel and so forth. That is a really a good a relationship. Um, that's a long standing one, and uh, they do an excellent job uh, with that, you know. And I, I do try, I'm involved here with my local county uh, group, and we're very well accepted by the uh, emergency, the professional emergency management staff at the, in the county seat, and uh, and even and down in uh, Gainesville for Alachua County, um, there's a very active uh, group uh, there who is very well received by a, a large uh, EOC staff and emergency management team. Again, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, Florida here, you know, prone to, as we just saw with Hurricane Ian and so forth, for you know, to major major disasters. At, uh, and so amateur radio was really well accepted uh, as a you know, as a backup communications resource here in the state and uh, in other states as well. So if I was going to say that I'd like to see, uh, you know, I'd like to see Aries more uh, involved with uh, the CERT program. That's a FEMA program, the Community Emergency Response Team concept, if you're familiar with that. Uh, that is based really on a local level, a micro level of the neighborhood. And uh, I think that's a, re- a great program. There, You know, Aries people are involved with that too. And, and I think that is, um, we'll see more of that, I think, in the future. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think I've heard about, you know, these CERT classes that do the amateur radio technician class over the weekend. And at the end of the weekend, you have your technician class license after listening to the lectures and doing the test questions and doing the test. But I got the impression from just a few episodes back that there was a disconnect between what CERT really is and the amateur radio portion that we thought was involved with CERT. Could you explain a little bit more about what CERT is then and how that differs from, say, ARES? Sure. Well, CERT stands for a Community Emergency Response Team. Um, It's sponsored by FEMA. It's administered at the local level. Um, But essentially, it's a, uh, at the the basic level there, it's a group of uh, neighbors who, uh, you know, get together for a little planning, you know, like a little barbecue in the backyard, and they get together and say, look, uh, you know, it'd be good for us to have a, you know, a neighborhood group that after a hurricane goes through who could you know walk around the neighborhood and make sure that all the neighbors are okay and that's the that's kind of the the basis for the program and uh and you know these people having the barbecue there they would go around the circle and maybe there's someone with some specific expertise maybe one is a registered nurse um or a doctor or uh or a fireman and or you know ham radio operator so uh you know and um uh, these people would, uh, after a you know a, after a disaster onset, they can go around the neighborhood and uh, you know do light you know light search and rescue if necessary. You know some basic uh, medical assistance, um, you know triage that type of thing, and uh, and you need to get communications to the EOC. Um, that's where the ham would come in, and uh, you know he would have a ideally a direct uh, you know, simplex, you know, channel to get to the EOC and give the EOC staff, uh, you know, an assessment of their neighborhood and, uh, and, and any emergency needs, that type of thing. So, um, you know, it's kind of a bit of an extension of a neighborhood watch, uh, you might call it. Right. That was what was going through my mind here. It sounds like federally subsidized neighborhood watch, the FEMA involvement. Right. They put together, uh, training classes and a lot of training materials and, and that type of thing. And, uh, uh, you know, your listeners can go to ready.gov and look on the cert page there for all sorts of uh, resources and information and so forth. So I really like that program a lot. The amateur radio portion of cert is that missing piece like a doctor. If your neighborhood has, you know, 30 houses you hope to have one of the skill sets in the neighborhood in those 30 houses. And if you don't have it, like you don't have a ham radio operator, then maybe the reason for running an amateur radio class in CERT is to make sure that you actually have a resource that you don't already have. Exactly right. Exactly right. You know, and they can use a family radio service, so, you know, FRS radios too, if necessary, or GMRS and, you know, et cetera. But, uh, 
Uh, but ideally, it's a you know it'd be a radio amateur who has all of the you know much more expertise and training and drills and practice and so forth. Yeah, so we have something like that here. What interested us is that your neighborhood has a box of walkie-talkies, for example, but nobody except the amateurs actually know how to take them out of the box, charge them, put the antennas on them, because it's a skill set that no one's ever done before. Right. Or to have the radios ready in operational working condition for that emergency when you actually need those radios. They're not still buried in the supply shed under boxes of other stuff. Right, with spider webs on them. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, that's uh, exactly right. Um, you know, that's one of the skill sets that uh, hams bring to the table is uh, that kind of technical expertise. You know, they understand, uh, you know, uh, twelve volt batteries and you know power supplies and you know, uh, you know, on the fly antennas and you know, and that type of things. So they do bring a lot more to the table. Have you had experiences with hams who've gotten their licenses from these cert classes and? essentially what happens after that to get them involved? Then I think they would, uh, they need to go through a cert training class. And those are usually held, you know, like EOCs, you know, at some county building a Red Cross regional headquarters, something like that. So I think that's the, that's the next step. Can we rely on cert classes for filling the ranks of amateur radio operators that we need in order to sustain the hobby? Sure. I, I, you know, I'm, and I just have the impression that it's kind of an untapped, you know, an untapped resource a little bit, you know, a cert meeting, anything like that would be great for, uh, you know, recruitment of, uh, of radio amateurs. How would you tap that resource then? It looks to me like we may actually have the amateurs licensed, but there was no follow-up after the test. Yeah, that can occur at a local club meeting. I mean, the, uh, you know, VEs give the exams, and you know, um, I know uh, you know local clubs would leave a flyer there, or maybe uh, outside of the exam room, uh, say, "Look, you know, congratulations. Why don't you come to our uh, our next club meeting? It's next Monday night, 7:30 at at the Red Cross uh, office there. Uh, you know, and join us and uh, learn about how you can, uh, you know, use your first radio here, to, you know, for public service and helping your and helping your neighborhood, and also, uh, you know, for a socialization with, you know, your fellow radio amateurs and, and so forth. So that's kind of how I see it, I guess. I see. So maybe the Venn diagram, the circles cross at certain ham radio clubs. The ham radio clubs know who the cert officers are or the people in charge and vice versa as a way to keep that channel open. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's that's the way it seems to me anyway. Um, so the local, local club, you know, Ham radio clubs are still very active across the country. We have uh, several of them here in this very rural county. Um, uh, several of them, and we have you know club meetings. We have a you know a very active Aries program. I'm, I'm involved with that, and uh, so it's a pretty you know I mean and we're just a very rural county, uh, but it's a very vibrant uh, ham radio community. You mentioned it earlier. One of the ways that you keep that vibrant and operating even in a rural area is you have regular nets. Yep, we have regular nets. Yep, ours meet on Thursday nights. There's other county areas programs that have their nets on the same night. So, uh, so I sit out there in my shack, and um, yeah, it's about four four different uh, county nets that I check into, and uh, the HF Northern Florida. Phone net. It's an Aries-oriented phone net that meets every morning at nine o'clock. So I, uh, I check into that too. And uh, there's a, has a lot, has a big roster of, uh, you know, check-ins to that net. Uh, works pretty well up here. Uh, but again, it's the, you know, necessity is the mother intervention. We, you know, Florida, we just get hammered with the terrible storms and uh, tornadoes and stuff like that. So, so Florida has three sections, and they're all very, uh, very, very active with the. Uh, Aries program and, and emergency communications and so forth. So we ran a uh, we ran an emergency communications academy at the national convention uh, last year, and it was just basically standing room only. There was so much interest, and we had uh, we had the the uh, Alachua County, which is basically Gainesville, and the University of Florida uh, ham community. Uh, some really excellent excellent uh, speakers, and you know technically very knowledgeable and they put on this uh you know this all-day program it was uh, just fabulous very well received 
So we've got some real talent here in, uh, in Florida. We will return to our guests in just a moment. Nuts and Volts Magazine is a new sponsor and is an amazing resource for new and old hams alike. Click on the banner to get your online or paper subscription of Nuts and Volts. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO Today. What was the digital national traffic system? In the late 80s, there's a group that came down from Montreal to introduce the lab staff and myself on uh, on packet radio. And that, that just fascinated me. And then we came up with uh, a system for relaying uh, uh, radiogram formatted messages uh, by packet radio. So we kind of introduced the, you know, the digital national traffic system, you know. And so I was uh, really involved with developing that in the mid to the 80s, basically. So kind of proud of that. I think it's, they're still going, I think, too. So are we talking like AX25 packet? Yeah, AX25 packet, right. Yeah, on VHF mostly. Yeah, on VHF. And we came up with, a, you know, kind of a system for, you know, routing messages across the country by packet bulletin board systems, essentially. Did that actually become a nationwide network? I mean, could you actually send a message across packet radio? Yeah, it was kind of a hybrid system between the packet network and the traditional national traffic system. So there were there were you know traditional traffic handlers that would go to the packet bulletin board systems and pick up traffic for their you know region or area or local net or whatever, and then either deliver them or take them to a local you know local net that type of thing for delivery. It would go from Massachusetts to Independence, Missouri. There it would be kicked off on HF you know across the Great Desert. Yeah. Kind of like the Western movement. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's right. We're getting into history now. Here we are. Using a Conestoga HF message delivery. <laughs> right, right. Um, of course, that's where we got Morse code, you know, was from the early telegraph days that uh, would, would be put up alongside the railroad tracks. So did that answer your question? That's very interesting because I actually, I missed that chapter of radio. I actually ended up building a commercial system for a power company using X.25 based on my limited knowledge of amateur packet radio, but I wasn't aware of the amateur radio nets during that period of time that were using AX25. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think they still uh, they still do it, too, I believe. I wrote an article about that uh, back in 1980s or something called Noon of a New Era, if you're if you want to read a little bit about the history of the development of that system, oh, it's in QST, late 80s, I think. I'll look that up and I'll put a reference to that in the show notes as well for the listeners. Is there something that we could be doing better, Rick, to attract new people to the hobby than we're doing now? <laughs> that's a, boy, that's a really a big question. You know, just I would just say more, you know, community uh, outreach. Uh, you know, a lot like uh, you know the Aries program. Community outreach, say, hey, listen, you know, we got these major disasters. Uh, you know, would you like to be involved with uh, supporting your Red Cross office and your EOC? And uh, here's a way you can do it. You can uh, and have fun and meet uh, new friends and so forth at the same time. You know, here's a ham radio club here right in, uh, in your town. Why don't you go over there? And chances are they'll be active in emergency communications. So you can get involved. You know, it's exciting. You're you're helping your community, et cetera, et cetera. I guess that would be what I would put out there. Right. For people that need a destination. I mean, I think one of the things that I mean, you're a retired person, I guess, or kind of retired. I mean, I don't think people even retire anymore. But, you know, once you get past your career working years, we all need a destination. Right. The local ARES could be a destination for many people. Absolutely. You know, we need to get more than just retirees in there, too. We really need to get, uh, you know, young people, young people involved. And that's really hard to do. It used to be a lot easier because there just wasn't a lot of other, you know, other activities to, to do. You had sports and uh, you had the chess club and so forth. And, and you had ham radio. Now there's just so much more young people can do and activities and everything. So it's, you know, it's harder to pull from that community, I think. What most excites you? about what's happening in amateur radio now? For me, it's 
about the, you know, my interest is in emergency communications. And uh, what is most exciting to me, I think, is the development of, of new uh, efficient modulation techniques uh, for, uh, you know, for conveying emergency messages. So like, uh, you know, one of the biggest ones in recent history is the is Winlink. Um, Winlink and uh, and not only the basic Winlink system, but all of the different uh, different modulation modes that uh, result in you know more throughput and more efficiency and and so forth. And that that's just ongoing, ongoing. And uh, the group down in Alachua that I just mentioned, they they're very heavily involved in uh, in developing those those kinds of things. And there's one particular individual. Like being able to send a spreadsheet of supplies over an HF connection. Yeah, exactly. Or a, uh, you know, they they have a there's a long list of templates, message templates on the Winlink platform that you can select the, you know, you can select an ICS two fourteen form there and you you know fill it out, you know, and then you stick it in your outbox on outbox on Winlink there and off it goes, you know. Um, so I guess that's really kind of exciting and. Uh, um, and also any you know, any new developments within you know antenna technology and and so forth or you know other other kind of you know modes like um, D star and uh, um, a D it was a D uh, a DMRS DMR right All Star exactly yeah I had my first uh, encounter with All Star here just a couple of weeks ago and that's you know that's unbelievable that's where it sounds great and covered you know the u.s really pretty well it was you know that's really pretty handy to uh, have in, a, in an emergency and it's hi-fi and it's hi-fi it sounds great and it's routed i'm a big fan of all-star yeah it's really pretty cool oh and it's open source yeah that, even nicer so rick would you have advice that you'd give to new or returning hams to the hobby with all of your years of experience yeah have fun you know <laughs> Try new things and just have a good time. You know that's the that's the bottom line. Um, and and go to your local club meetings and uh, you'll meet a lot of really interesting people. Uh, and you'll meet their families. You'll have you know social uh, you know uh, occasions. You know field day. That's just a blast. You know. Um, and you don't need to be a you don't need to be a crack operator to uh, enjoy it. I mean I'm a t- I'm a basically a lid to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I'm not a very good operator, but I sure have a lot of fun still, still to uh, this day. So I've been a ham yeah, since '76. So how many years is that? Is that like 40 years or something like that? 47. 47 years. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. I'm out there every. Uh, I have, my ham shack is in a an old shipping container. If you know what those are, they you know they load them onto. Do you have the 20-foot shipping container or the 40-foot shipping container? No, I have the 20-foot. It's perfect. You know, my wife, she has the house, and I have that container back there. <laughs> so that really works out pretty well, you know. I would see that it would, yeah. My, no, my wife gave me the basement. We actually have a rental apartment on our house, and so I have the rental apartment downstairs. She says it serves two purposes, and you'll have to guess which two. Well. So if I'm in the doghouse, the doghouse is down here. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I met my first wife uh, at league headquarters. She uh, sadly passed away uh, about 10 years or so ago, uh, but uh, she was a secretary in the old communications department at headquarters in the, in Newington. So, uh, so we got married and uh, we were together for, uh, you know, years and years and years until she passed away from cancer, unfortunately. And, uh, my second career was in nursing. I think I mentioned that as a nurse at the uh, the big city hospital in Daytona Beach. And then I met my second wife, my current wife uh, there. But I have not been able to get her interested in ham radio yet. So, <laughs> um, Did your interest in nursing, was that a result of being with your first wife as she went through her bout of cancer? Yeah, that is a, a, a very astute uh, Observation there, Eric. That's exactly uh, exactly what happened. We had, uh, you know, I'd had a 20-year career at at headquarters, and uh, my wife one day just said, you know, would you mind moving to Florida so I can help my sister take care of uh, our mother? And there's only, you know, there's only one right answer to that. Of course, you know, as soon as we got here in 2001, she was diagnosed with. Uh, 
ovarian cancer, and we met a lot of nice, uh, a lot of nice doctors and nurses and professional medical staff, of course. And uh, I needed something to do. There was no, there was no headquarters in Florida. So I was almost 50, and I uh, went to nursing school at uh, Daytona State College for an associate of science degree in nursing. And then I worked as a uh, ICU nurse for 13 years at that at that big hospital. So, um, uh, so the, the short answer to your question, your astute question, was, uh, yeah, that had a lot to do with it. It might have also taught you something else, and that is that you can reinvent yourself at any point in your life, right? That's absolutely true, yeah. It was, you know, some of my friends said, she, why, you know, why are you going to, you know, nursing school? I and mean, that's all girls, you know? And I said, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be hard. You know, when you're young, you don't think that way. But you're more mature, and you actually can think that way. Yeah. Well, the other nice thing about it, I mean, it sounds, you know, uh, kind of cliche, but, uh, you know, you're 50 years old. You start to, you know, think about what the meaning of your life is. Uh, you know, nursing is a profession where you, you know, you give a lot of yourself, to, but to help, uh, you know, help sick people and going through the worst times of their lives. And uh so that is, you know, that's provided a lot of meaning um, for my life anyway. And uh, so I've been very lucky in life. I, I've, I've had two fantastic careers and uh, I'm happy to be retired now. <laughs> so Yeah, I get that. Now, I think that anybody that's lived with someone that has a chronic illness realizes that the nurses are the kind of the most important ingredient to healing. You know, your physicians kind of facilitate procedure. But it's the nurses in the end that are the ones that are kind of doing the healing. This has been my experience. Yeah, they're the ones that administer all the you know, the medications and so forth. But the, their most important function is uh, they are the front line. Their, their responsibility is to, uh, hey, is something going wrong with this patient? You know, uh, you know it's not quite right, you know, or, or even more overt, you know, this guy's blood pressure is tanking here. Uh, you know, his, his oxygenation is bad. And, uh, you know, you've got to pick up on that. You have to have the ability, uh, you have to have critical thinking ability. And uh, because the doctor's not there uh, all the time. Um, and you've got to make the call and tell them, hey, look, we've got this, uh, here's the issue, and get it fixed, you know, fast in some cases, you know. So I always thought that was the number one priority for any nurse, especially in the intensive care unit where you've got, uh, you know, I mean, those people are, you know, they're unstable. Um, you know, you, nowadays you have to be really, really sick to get admitted to a hospital. But to get under the ICU, you, now you've got to be really, 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 really sick. So, you know, and uh, you've got to be on the ball and identify, uh, you know, potential problems. And so those people's lives are in your hands, you know, so. I don't mean to sound so you know dramatic, but uh, but it's true. Can I ask what does the future look like for Rick Palm? Do you have anything that you want to tackle now that you haven't tackled yet? No, I can't really think of anything. I'm too I'm too way too old now for mountaineering. But uh, uh, my first love is uh, nature, so I spend a lot of time uh, kayaking up on the Okefenokee Swamp, which is a 700 square mile raw wilderness in southern Georgia, and uh, no one goes there because they're all afraid of alligators, which really aren't a, which really aren't a problem. So I have that place a lot to my, just myself. And I go in the dead of winter, and uh, that's what I really, really love to do these days. So do you fish when you're kayaking there? No, I don't fish at all. I, You know, it sounds ridiculous, but I kind of feel sorry for the I, I, I just can't throw a hook in the water and watch a, a creature struggle with its life coming out. You know? But I have no problem eating one in a restaurant. I'll tell you what comes to mind is I was watching a YouTube the other day of a guy. He was in a kayak. He's going through this swamp, and he tosses his hook that looks like a rat you know, into the water, and he pulls out this 50-pound thing. And I'm thinking, that's a perfect afternoon. I mean, if you can take it home and clean it and eat it, but I'm going off on a tangent here. No, no problem. Yeah, no problem. It created a very interesting visual moment for me in the Okie Snoky Swamp. Yeah, it's a uh, 
it's a very unusual uh, waterscape. It has a unique geology and has a fascinating cultural history, too. Is it a freshwater swamp? Yeah, it's a freshwater swamp, right. It's black water, a lot of uh, tannins from, you know, the trees and so forth uh, darken the water. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting place. Um, too spooky for most people. And that's fine with me because then I have the, sometimes I have the whole place to myself. You know, 700 square miles of just raw wilderness. So, so it's that. I, I've paddled the entire Suwannee River. That's 242 miles. So I do, I do stuff like that nowadays, you know. And then more mundane things, too, like uh, I play golf <laughs> uh, poorly, but uh, do that, too, a little bit. <laughs> it seems to me that a place like Florida must have golf courses. Oh, yeah, there are probably, uh, probably more golf courses per capita than anywhere in the world, I would guess. Well, Rick, it's been a real pleasure to meet you and to talk to you about you and amateur radio and your contribution to the league. I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. This has been a lot of fun for me. Boy, Eric, I you know I'll, I'll, I really enjoyed this. I, mean, I was nervous. I'm, I'm really a very shy, uh, introverted individual, fan clay, and uh, so the, it's you know I was really kind of nervous going up for this uh, interview. But as it turned out, I really enjoyed doing it. You're an excellent interviewer and fun to talk to. So it made my old day. Well, thank you so much. Seventy three, Rick. 73, Eric, 4Z1UG, from K1 Charlie Echo, 73. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Rick. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in K1CE in the search box at the top of the page. Be sure to click on the Expo menu item at the top of the page for updates, including buying tickets to the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo coming next weekend. My thanks to ICOM America for their continued support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of this fine sponsor by clicking on their link in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, click on the transcribe button at the top of the show notes page. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. By using the Amazon link on the home page before you shop at Amazon allows Amazon to send us a small commission on what you purchase that further keeps our QSO Today project going. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as we work towards episode 500. QSO Today is now available on a large number of podcast players and now a host of podcast services and applications. We are Podcast 2.0 compatible. I now use the Fountain Podcast Player to listen to all of my favorite podcasts. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.